thank you very much and thank you to acapella for hosting me. It's wonderful to be here and especially to see so many of you in this um, beautiful Atlanta weather. So I appreciate your coming out. What I normally do is talk about hip hop because hip hop contains amazing, intelligent, uh, beautiful, they call it the beautiful struggle, but beautiful views about a justice system that would work well. And that's surprising. We don't expect to hear that vision from hip hop, but um, one of the things I, I do in this, um, in this multimedia thing is to, to show how articulate hip hop is about ways to improve our, our justice system. Um, and when I do that talk, um, I don't sound a lot like a, a prosecutor, which is what I used to be. So, so people ask, well, what happened? And it wasn't one thing in particular, but there were um, some things. And, and one kind of big thing happened. So that's what I want to um, talk just for a few minutes about tonight. So I'm going to read just um, a short excerpt from the first chapter that talks about some of my experiences and how I became what I now think of as a recovering prosecutor. So this is from chapter one, which is called The Hunter Gets Captured by the Game, An American Prosecutor Meets Criminal Justice. I am prosecuting a prostitute. She barely speaks English. We're in a cell, we're in a room more like a cell than a courtroom. It's a corridor of the District of Columbia Superior Court devoted to non-jury that's the venue for minor crimes. When lawmakers don't want people to have jury trials for certain offenses, they make the sentence for the crime less than six months in jail because then you're not entitled to a jury trial. Judges, you see, are more likely to convict than juries. In this hallway, justice is processed with extreme efficiency. A good judge and prosecutor working as a team can get through four or five trials a day. Crowded inside the little room are the prostitute, a court-appointed defense attorney, a police officer, the judge, me, and my mother. <laughs> it's my mom's first time seeing me in trial, and I want to impress her. The facts of solicitation for prostitution cases are always the same. Plain clothes, male officer, and countess prostitute, she offers sexual favor in exchange for cash, and he arrests her. These aren't your high-class call girls, but rather street walkers, the old-fashioned skanky kind, complete with pimp, drug habit, and tragic backstory. It's actually difficult to get arrested for prostitution in the District of Columbia, where it's a crime, but not a big police priority. Everybody, sex workers, customers, and cops knows what's where. 14th Street is biological women, 9th Street is transvestites, 5th Street, not far from the courthouse, is male hustlers. On Friday and Saturday nights, there are so many Johns and other gawkers that they create a minor traffic jam. Generally, nobody cares. It's a business district anyway. At night, the lawyers and lobbyists are home in the suburbs. So now it's the streets rather than the offices that are devoted to service for hire. And sure, the police department has a vice squad, but how much can it do, really? The relationship between beat cops and habitual criminals is polite semi-respectful. Each understands that the other has a job to do. Sometimes, however, citizens complain, especially when they see the cops and the girls yucking it up. Then there's a showy crackdown for a few days. It's just an annoyance to the principals. The world's oldest profession is certainly not surrendering. If anything, it will just temporarily switch corners. Police sweeps don't eradicate crimes like prostitute and drug selling. They just make those activities less orderly. Most of the girls know who the undercover cops are, but my defendant has broken two rules. The police report says that she approached the plainclothes officer and offered to perform oral sex. She probably didn't use those words for $25. Rule number one, always recognize the UCs, undercover cops. Second, she has the temerity to actually go to trial. And rule number two is plead your case. Throw yourself on the mercy of the judge. Unless you have an exceptionally long string of convictions, you most likely will get sentenced to probation and a drug treatment program, and you could be back on the street the same day. You plead because there is basically no defense in these cases other than general denial. 
And who is a judge going to believe? An officer of the Metropolitan Police Department or a Vietnamese girl who happened to be on 14th Street at 2 a.m. in the morning in a hot pants, a bikini top, and stilettos, please. And my mother is watching me? I cannot wait for my cross-examination. I am going to let this whore have it. I am now prosecuting a United States senator. After practicing on the District of Columbia's hookers, addicts, and assorted street thugs, I graduated to the Department of Justice's Public Integrity Section. Three years into it, I'm assigned the biggest case of my career. Senator David Durenberger, Republican of Minnesota, has rigged an illegal scheme to get the government to pay his mortgage. By the time the FBI catches him, he's defrauded the taxpayers out of a few thousand dollars. After three years of prosecuting public corruption cases, I'm not surprised that some big time politicians are sleazes. The startling thing is how low their price is. We charged the senator with multiple felonies. It's one of the most important cases in the Justice Department. As a young lawyer, I'm lucky to be on the case. I'm sure it didn't hurt that I'm black. We indicted Durenberger in the District of Columbia, where the jurors are mainly African American. I'm only the second chair. The senior lawyer, a white guy, is just a few years older than I am, but he has a lot more experience. As long as I get to do a nice opening or closing statement and a couple of juicy cross-examinations, I'll be a happy camper. This is the kind of high-profile case that can make a lawyer's career. Life for this young prosecutor is sweet. Shortly before the Durenberger case is supposed to go to trial, I get arrested. Simple assault is the crime I'm accused of committing. There's nothing simple about simple assault. That was the joke made a few years before my arrest as I was trained how to prosecute that crime by the misdemeanor section chief who later directed my own prosecution. What I didn't know then, what a man who makes his living putting people in prison cannot afford to believe, is that there's nothing simple about any accusation of crime. I had to learn that the hard way. Criminal justice is what happens after a complicated series of events has gone wrong. It's the end result of failure, failure that the failure of a group of people that includes, but is never limited to, the accused person. So what I'm not saying is that prison should be abolished, that people should not be held accountable for their actions. I don't believe that. I've locked up thugs who I hope never see the light of day. I will never deny that society needs an official way to punish the bad guys. Otherwise, if somebody did the unthinkable, say, kill my loved one, I would kill him myself. The criminal justice system gives the state a monopoly in exercising that kind of retribution. It's legal hate. The problem with hate is it's hard to contain. In the United States, the rush to punish is out of control. So in addition to the violent creeps I put away, I sent hundreds of other people to prison who should not be there. Their incarceration only makes things worse for them and especially for us on the outside. We would all be better off if I had lost those cases. We'd be safer and more free. But I was too good a prosecutor to lose much. And then I got locked up myself. So all I'm saying is that this shit's complex. Just going to read a, a little bit about my actual prosecution, and then um, let's, let's have a short conversation. At the beginning of my trial, the trial in which I am cast in the lead role and somebody else plays the prosecutor, the judge tells the jury, this case arises from a dispute between two people about a parking space. Dramatic pause. Neither one of them drives a car. The newly sworn in jurors have put on their serious faces, but a couple of them look amused. I would think it was kind of funny, too, if it was happening to somebody else. I joke about it at happy hour after a long day in court. First, a quick biography emphasizing the items that make an arrest at age 33 unlikely. Yale College and Harvard Law School, both cum laude, prestigious clerkship with a federal judge, cushy job at high-powered Washington, D.C. law firm, 
than federal prosecutor in the most elite unit in the Department of Justice. Now the counter story, emphasizing the items that make lack of arrest by age 33 surprising. Raised by a single mom in poor black neighborhood on the south side of Chicago, when not at work, dress in the current fashion like a thug. Nice eyes chip on my shoulder, afflicted with the black man's thing for respect by any means necessary. Don't like the police much, even though I work with them every day. Can be a smart ass. So this chapter goes on to tell this story about this woman named Detroit. That was her real name, who was my, my neighbor, who um, was a snitch for the police. Um, in addition to that, commandeered a parking space that belonged to my apartment that I craftily decided to, to rent out because I didn't have a car. Um, she didn't like that because she was renting out the parking space as well. And so she started leaving these threatening notes on the um, car of the person who I rented it to. Um, and one day I came out and saw that she'd vandalized. Actually, I woke up, looked out the window and saw that she'd vandalized the car. Um, so I went outside to look at it. And I'm just going to read you what happened then. First, I go out to, Do to Donna's car to inspect it for damage. I remember from my prosecutor's training that DC police take claims of destruction to cars more seriously than other kinds of minor crimes. The joke among prosecutors was, if your boyfriend beats you up, don't say, he hit me and I'm bleeding when you call 911. The, poli the police will take hours to come. Say, somebody put sugar in my gas tank and they'll be there in three minutes. Donna's car didn't look seriously damaged. There was just sawdust all over it. I'm headed back inside to call the police when all of a sudden there's no longer a need to do so. Three police cars, sirens blaring, flew into the parking lot. Several cops jumped out yelling at me, put your hands in the air, motherfucker. Lean against the car. Then came the words I'd spent my whole life trying to avoid. You're under arrest. What? Why? I was in a state of disbelief. This had to be a joke. Simple assault. Detroit had called 911 and said that somebody spread sawdust on her porch. She claimed that as she was sweeping it up, I ran up to her and pushed her and she fell down. She was now suffering from back pain. That's ridiculous, I told the police. They should call Donna to get the history of the whole dispute. And anyway, who would go anywhere near Detroit with these two German shepherds standing guard? The police weren't listening. My arresting officer was a muscular, bald man who looked like a Nazi if the Nazis had accepted applications from Puerto Ricans. So I played my trump card. I'm a prosecutor. The cop looked interested. I hoped this would be an opening. I needed one badly. I couldn't get arrested. I didn't go to Harvard Law School to end up just another nigger with a record. I showed the officer my Justice Department ID. He inspected it carefully. Then he smirked and said, so I'm sure you know this already. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you. You have the right to an attorney. If you can't afford one, one will be provided for you. And so then I'm just going to read the um, kind of cutting to the chase. Has the jury reached a unanimous verdict, the judge asked. Yes, the forewoman says. Mr. Butler, please rise. As Michelle, my lawyer, stands up with me, she touches my hand and whispers, I did my best. You never know what a jury's going to do, but we gave it our best. What is the verdict of the jury? Your Honor, we, the jury, find the defendant not guilty. It's like a movie. I hug Michelle and my friends in the courtroom cheer. The Nazi-looking police officer stalks out of the courtroom like he's mad. The judge smiles at me and says, Mr. Butler, you're free to go. I want to say that the prosecutors hung their heads, but they probably just packed up and left. Uh, that's what I did when I lost a case. They certainly didn't apologize. I never did either when I got a not guilty verdict. Usually, 
I blame the jurors. My story is different from the 14 million people who get arrested every year in the US. I had the best defense attorney in the city because I could afford her. I knew how to appeal to a jury. Hell, I prosecuted people in the very courtroom where I was being prosecuted. So in addition to carefully preparing my testimony, I knew to make sure that my haircut was conservative and my shoes were shined. I knew how to look like the kind of African American a jury would not want to send to jail. I was innocent, by the way. During the process, that fact seemed rather beside the point. Our criminal justice system works like a meat grinder. You're supposed to proceed in orderly fashion from arrest to guilty plea to sentencing. More than 90% of criminal cases are resolved just that way. Sometimes I still hate the woman who falsely accused me. She tried to destroy me. I was innocent, really. Maybe you don't completely believe me either. That's another effect of my prosecution. I'm not as innocent as I once was. I have a record. We need our criminal justice system to understand Detroit. She did a terrible thing. That's different, however, from saying that she, we should respond as if she's a terrible human being. She appeared to have some serious mental health issues. She thought that she had to get back at a pompous lawyer who ruined her little part-time hustle. She needed something validated in what she did, and she did what she thought she had to do. She's pathetic more than she's evil. What she did could have destroyed a less privileged person. As for me, I kept my job, my friends, most of my social status. In some ways, the experience was useful. It made a man out of me, a black man. I now share a bond with lots of people from whom I used to feel disconnected. So those are the places I let myself go. I don't dwell too long on other stuff because it still hurts. I never told my mother. She'll find out when she reads this. In the African American community, it's a big thing when a mom can brag that she never had to go to the courthouse. I don't doubt that my mother would have been incredibly supportive and sympathetic. Ma's got no love for the police. She still quakes with anger when she talks about the time my stepfather, then 65, got into a minor car accident with a vehicle driven by a white man, and the court ordered my, the cops ordered my stepfather to get in the back seat of the car while they'll talk to the white driver. Still, if my mother had known, she would have insisted on coming to the trial, and I couldn't have that. I've seen too many black mothers seated in the courtroom in the row behind their sons, crying. I didn't want to see my mother in that place. I would prefer that her memory of superior court be of me in trial, not on trial. I don't know what I'm ashamed of. I do know that my arrest and prosecution hurt me in ways I still haven't touched and probably never will. We need our criminal justice system to understand all of that. Thank you. So um, how about you know, a couple of comments and questions, and then we'll have a hip hop party. There, there could be consequences. For example, if, yeah, so the question is, are there consequences when someone makes up a story that implicates another person in, in a crime? Um, and the answer is, technically, legally, yes. So it's a crime to falsely report that someone else committed a crime. It's also, as we all know, a crime to, uh, to, to lie in court, to commit perjury, which is what Detroit did. Uh, those cases are rarely prosecuted. Um, they're hard to prove. Um, again, just because a jury finds someone innocent doesn't mean that um, either technically that that person really didn't do it. Um, so there's still some hardcore types in the US Attorney's Office, for example, who don't speak to me um, because they think that I, I committed a crime. So the answer is those cases are rarely prosecuted. Um, you know, in the book, one of the things I talk about that's relevant to residents of Atlanta is where that happens in cases that are a lot more troubling than my own case, um, and that's with snitches. So snitches are police informants who get some kind of benefit 
um, for testifying. And usually the benefit is, is cash money or it's uh, a break in their own criminal prosecution. And many of you are familiar with a, a horrible case in Atlanta a couple years ago where a 90-year-old woman was murdered by these three men who were breaking down the door to her house. Um, she shot, she was scared to death um, to leave the house. She shot once through the door. Um, they then tore down the door and shot her 38 times. And after they shot her, they put her body in handcuffs. And these three men were officers of the Atlanta Police Department. And they'd been told, lied to by a snitch, um, that someone was, that drugs were being dealt from that house. So again, that's the case where people lie um, to make cases against other people. That's a lot more common, I think, than what happened to me, and, and a lot more troubling. Any other comments? Well, even just release would be, uh, I'm sorry. So I don't think people should go to prison for using drugs or for selling drugs to other consenting adults. So the question is, well, what would happen? Or what would our world look like? Um, you know, I started out by making this argument um, about the African-American community, um, that African-American drug users and dealers uh, shouldn't be prosecuted. And I've now expanded that to no one should be prosecuted for, for drug crimes. But people used to ask, well, what would the black community look like if we didn't lock up its drug users and drug sellers? And my answer was always, it would look like the white community. Um, most people who use drugs, actually, African American or white, don't go to prison. We all know that. Most of the people in this room, statistically, have used drugs. And um, I don't know if anyone other than me has actually been to prison. And even I didn't go to prison for drug use, although I've used drug, drugs plenty of times. Um, I've never uh, actually been stopped by the police for anything that I've done, any crime that I've actually committed. been stopped by the police a lot, but again, never for a crime that I've committed. So I have a chapter about drugs and the law in the book um, where the first thing I do is, is come out about some of my recreational use of drugs, including that when I started prosecuting, um, I made myself uh, swear that I wasn't going to smoke pot anymore. Um, it wasn't such a hard promise to keep because it's never been a big thing. But in all of the circles I travel, um, especially at Yale and Harvard, um, and then at the law firm, um, a lot of people smoke weed. And it's recreational. It was fun. Um, and so it was weird to kind of put myself in this mode where I'd be working up these frothy closing statements trying to put this particular drug dealer in prison. Um, and I didn't really believe it. And, and, and as an academic, now I'm free to say, say why. So um, public health, to the extent that people using drugs and selling drugs is a problem, um, the public health system is the best way to deal with that problem. And again, maybe if, if locking up drug users and sellers worked, if it helped make communities safer, I would reluctantly endorse it. Uh, but it doesn't do that. So economists talk about this thing called the replacement effect, which means that the police uh, lock up you know, Julio and T-Bone. They're, they're selling drugs on the corner now. Um, the police lock them up. Next day, uh, DeAndre, Lucretia are there to take their place. That's going to keep happening until you lock up. Well, now in the African American community, we have one in three of our young black men locked up. And DC is actually half. Half of the black men in their 20s have a criminal case. So there's got to be a better solution. Yes, sir. You know, I, I was being flipped with. Um, my response that in order to, of the question was, what would I have done differently uh, the day that I was arrested? Um, but in, in the chapter, I go more into um, my mindset, which is that I'm a prosecutor. I, I love to point my finger at the bad guy. Um, I, I love to avenge wrong. Um, and one of the th things I think a lot about um, in the book is, is this mindset that prosecutors have. Um, and it's an interesting psychology. Um, you know, I wonder out loud in the book if it's related to the, um, 
my feelings about some of the boys who I went to school with when I was um, growing up on the south side of Chicago. Um, and some of those boys didn't treat a guy who got uh, good test scores and talked kind of like a white boy, didn't treat him so good. And so 15 years later, um, I'm seeing guys like that at the defense table. And again, I'm pointing my finger at him. I'm calling him names. I'm getting in his face. That's part of my job. So it's the psychology that I have that I actually transfer um, to this case that I was building against Detroit. So what I would do every day, I talk about in the book, is um, I wanted to catch her leaving one of these notes on the car. So I actually put this camera next to my window. And I would watch every night, waiting to take a picture. Um, and I actually didn't see her doing that. But that morning when I woke up and looked out the window, that was the first thing I did every morning during that period. Um, I saw it. So, you know, what I would have done differently is, is chilled out. <laughs> chilled out a little bit. Um, you know, that doesn't excuse what, what she did. Um, but uh, it, it's what prosecutors are, are like. And so part of what the book is about is how those feelings um, get out of control. Because prosecutors run shit now. And by run shit, I mean they run our criminal justice system. They get whatever they want. And a lot of them think just like, like I did. So I know you guys have been here for a long time, so a couple more questions, and then we'll, we'll have the hip-hop party. JD, you know, well, uh, my friend John here, John is here, um, who trains public defenders in, in the South, um, many of whom are some of the best lawyers um, you could hope to have. Um, in fact, my lawyer, the best lawyer in D.C., was a former public defender. So the first thing to do is to, to note how great so many public defenders are but they just don't have the funding in a lot of cities that they need. In D.C., they do. They happen to, um, for various political reasons, have that funding. So D.C. has the best public defense service in the United States. Um, other places, especially in the South, not so great. So the most important thing to do is to um, fund lawyers for poor people. And when we talk about the dysfunctional politics of, of criminal justice, you know, we, we understand how difficult that turns out to be. Um, I remember, I don't know if there's anyone here from the, um, what was then the um, Southern Prisoners Defense Committee, it's now the Southern Human Rights um, Organization. Anybody here from there? John, I know you've spent some, yeah, and Carla, my friend Carla Friend, used to work there. Um, very quickly, one of the cases I worked on as a summer intern there um, had to do with a lawsuit um, against a county in Georgia um, that Legally, of course, if you're a poor person, you have the right to a lawyer, right? So for people who were charged with capital offenses, crimes for which if they were guilty, they could be executed, um, this district had to have a way to uh, provide lawyers. And what they did was a low bidding system. So whatever lawyer bid the lowest amount for the case got the case. And that's kind of an example of what happens to poor people. Um, I walked away from my experience thinking, um, you know, it was, it was nice that I was innocent, but I'm not sure that was the most important fact for my acquittal. I'd say by far the most important fact was my um, expensive and very good lawyer. So it's almost like you'd rather, have a, um, you'd rather be guilty and have a great lawyer um, than be innocent and, and have a not good lawyer. I, I mean, the answer is yes and no. So, it, you know, you hate to say it, it's not a big deal um, because it was a big deal. One of the things I do when I think about hip hop and criminal law is to understand that now for a lot of young black men, it, it's not a big deal to get arrested. So the hip hop slang for, for uh, getting arrested is called catching a case, kind of like catching a cold, not, not such a big deal. You know, it's a little bit your fault, but a little bit just what happens, shit happens. Um, and I don't feel like that. It, it was a big deal. Um, I never talked about this. This happened uh, more than 10 years ago. Um, and I never talked about it until I wrote this book. And I'm speaking about it in front of large audiences. But my students, um, I teach criminal law. I teach criminal procedure. I teach race, racism, and the law. So all of this is relevant right, to, to that. But I never talked about it. So there is something. Uh, uh, wounded sounds kind of too tragic, um, but it is a big deal. And, and 
I re I'm, I'm recovered, I'm, I'm doing great. But the fact that, again, 14 million people get arrested every year in the United States, um, about half of the people who are locked up for, for are there for nonviolent drug crimes, and it's not doing them or us any good to be locked up for that. So um, even more important than kind of you know, my minor trauma um, is the trauma that this over-incarceration inflicts in our, our country. Um, and to answer one last answer to the gentleman's question about is there any reason for optimism, at this point, the best reason for optimism um, is we can't afford it anymore. It costs about $60,000 a year to, to lock up people. Um, if you multiply that by the more than 2 million people who are locked up, imagine if we spent that money on, on health care, on education, on job training. In, in the Bronx, they have these blocks that are called million-dollar blocks because if you take all of the people who live in that block who are in the system, the government actually spending a million dollars on that block. So the idea is, how about spending that money to improve their schools, um, to give them health care, give them job training? Well, I didn't defend myself because I would have lost. <laughs> um, lawyers are, are the worst clients. And in fact, I talk about during the trial, um, I wasn't I, such a great witness at first because I was so mad. The U.S. Attorney's Office had two lawyers on my case, including this, this senior uh, prosecutor who was African American. I hated that guy. Um, and when he cross-examined me, um, it came through. And so he got started. The drug, the, the judge declared a, a, a lunch break. And my lawyer took me in the hall and let me have it and, and said, my anger was coming through. It was kind of almost, she didn't say it, but it was almost kind of like I did it. I could tell she was thinking. Um, and it was just because I was so angry. So well, lawyers often make the, the worst client and even not so great witnesses. So I knew the technical stuff. Again, if you go to, D, if you go to trial in D.C. in front of those old black people, you must have your shoe shine. That's rule number one. So I knew that. I knew all that stuff. But in terms of uh, kind of calming down, chilling out, and just telling what happened, it turned out to be harder to do. Um, and it was, there was this bizarre schizophrenia, to answer the second part of your question, about going to work every day, putting bad guys in jail, and then coming home at night and working with my lawyer and investigator about how I could keep my ass out of jail. So it was weird. <laughs> and, and that's what the last chapter of the book is about. So there's um, a number of things that you can do to encourage the president, who, who definitely gets it. He, he says all of the right things, including that it's, it's counterproductive to lock up people for, um, for nonviolent drug offenses. Um, he doesn't think that's smart public policy. But you know he's got two wars going on, a failing economy. So he needs to be moved. So the last chapter suggests a number of measures from the non-controversial. So if you want to get the dope boys off the street corners, um, the best thing you can do is to get them to graduate from high school. Because the people who are standing in the corners, by and large, are young men who haven't graduated from high school. And we know how to do that. It's controversial. My mom doesn't like it. But the way we do it is to pay them. We pay them to go to high school. It works. It's cost effective gets them off the street corner. Um, but other ways, anything you can do to help a kid graduate from high school um, will make the street safer and reduce the level of, car of incarceration. And since this is the last question, and you did ask, the um, controversial suggestion in the book is jury nullification. So when you are a juror, or when you know people who sit on juries, tell them just because some prosecutor tells them to convict, that doesn't mean that they have to. So they should think about whether it's in their best interest to lock this guy up. And I learned about jury nullification as a prosecutor um, in DC. During training, the rookies were told that sometimes we would convince a jury beyond a reasonable doubt that a guy was guilty, and the jurors would acquit. And the reason they wouldn't do this, and the prosecutors, they would kind of roll their eyes when they said this, is because they didn't want to send another black man to jail. And it turned out to be true. We started trying cases, we rookies did, 
and we saw that. Usually happened in drug cases, almost never in cases of, of violent crime. And when I started teaching, it was the first thing I wanted to study. And I found out it's constitutional. In fact, it's a proud part of our American constitutional tradition. It's legal. No juror has ever been successfully prosecuted for doing that because, again, you have a constitutional right. The weird thing is the Supreme Court decided this case that I talk about that says that even though jurors have this power, they don't have to be told about this. And so lawyers can't tell jurors about it in the courtroom. But there's nothing to stop Paul Butler or you from telling your friends, uh, again, to think about whether it makes sense to lock up someone um, for a nonviolent drug transaction, either an uh, adult using or an adult selling a small amount to a, another um, adult. If I had one of those cases um, as a juror, then I would vote for acquittal. So I think we're going to go over to the other room now. I'll be happy to continue this conversation there. Thank you all very much for coming. Thank you. Thanks. 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 Thank you.